Part 14 of Collected Prose by James Elroy Flecker This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 5 of The Grecians The Grecians, or True Education the melodious name of Florence calls up such delightful and extravagant memories that many wayfarers, who have the love of books and pictures in their souls, have been disappointed with the austere appearance of the city, with her narrow, yet straight and gloomy streets, her huge rectangular palaces, her vast and unsatisfying cathedral. But if, on a summer afternoon, a man should ascend, as our friends ascended, the hill of Fiesole, he would see, from that famous eminence, the city of flowers wonderfully set among her gardens and villas, and he would appreciate that tremendous dome which rises high above the plain of Arno, like some fabled antique omphalus of the world. And he might cry, perverting to himself, that gentle ballad of old, Where will you bury me? In St. Mary of the Flowers. Wherewith will you cover me? with violets and roses. They sat on the terrace of a little inn, gazing at the prospect in the glorious light of afternoon, for they had already stretched forth their hands over the dainties and eaten and drunk in abundance. It had been arranged that they should not discuss what Smith called true education, but that he should write down for them his thoughts on the subject in connected form. And this he had done. Do let us hear you read now, Harold," said Edwinson. The young man took a sheaf of paper out of his pocket, and quietly began. I require that those who listen to my words should hold one faith with me. They must believe with me in the value of human reason. They must love beautiful things and consider them important. They must be enthusiastic for their fellow men. They must believe that it is possible to learn and even that it is possible to teach. Otherwise, my words will be vain, and convey neither meaning nor persuasion. I have to realise that I have little new to say. I, like Plato, desire to create philarches. If we really understand that golden book of the Republic, such a type of the classic in its form, so strangely modern in its theory, so simple and so subtle, we shall perhaps think, that no more need to be said, and that by close following of its precepts we may be able to create Villarkis in modern England. We must realise that in attacking poetry as a means of education, Plato is merely attacking, under a decent veil, the popular religion of which Homer was the Bible. We must be perpetually on the watch for Plato's quiet humour, and then the Republic becomes for us in practical matters a wise and attractive guide. Yet we have to adapt Plato's theories to the modern world, and that is what I shall now attempt. Forgive me, then, if I become dull, prosaic, and detailed in my ardour for common sense. I have not prepared a surprise for you. I am not going to expound any startling or novel theory. I am not going to suggest a shortcut to perfection. But I am going to trace out in detail a course of education which I hope will appeal to the thoughtful as possible, desirable, and sufficient. I must suppose, moreover, for my purposes, that the school which is to rise on that bright English bay of ours will somewhat partake of the nature of a university. I must have at least five years of a boy's intelligent life, for the education I intend to give to those who are fit to receive it, whom I intend henceforward to call Grecians, borrowing a delightful term from the traditions of Christ's hospital, is very universal and very difficult. Keeping clear before me all the danger I run of turning my pupils into dilettanti, I am going to teach them to be as far as possible universal in their comprehension and admiration of the mysteries and beauties of life. Our Grecians, when they leave us, will have seen, as it were, from a height, suddenly, the whole world of knowledge stretching out in rich plains and untraversed seas. Let me at this point lay down very clearly who these Grecians of mine will be. I intend education to be given in the complete form which I am going to describe to those boys in the school who have the best and most refined intelligence. 
in an ideal state these boys would not have to earn their living they would automatically become rulers of the state or else be subsidised to live in leisure as artists or critics in our actual england we can give this complete education only to the sons of the rich and to those few boys which our school funds enable us to support not only here but afterwards to give a boy this complete education we must keep him until he is at least twenty-one in england of the present day he would find himself at that age well prepared to take after another year's special work such as an examination as that admitting to the indian civil service i mention this because it may show that some parents might risk leaving their sons with us to receive a useless and fine education and yet hope that boys so educated might subsequently earn their livings even in the existing state of society but the whole virtue and beauty of true education must depend on its absolute isolation from the prying influence of the state or university i do not mean by this that we shall object to examinations as such but we will have nothing to do with examinations which lead us out of our chosen path our only examinations will be the school examinations by examining boys and by no other method shall we admit them to our select company by examining we will assign to them their rank in the school i have little patience with those who abuse examinations an examiner may be stupid and set worthless papers but provided the papers be well set examination is the sole adequate test of a boy's capacity for we have no sympathy with cecil rhodes nor with the cheerful popular and chiefly ignorant crowds who come to oxford under his fantastic testament we do not like this democratic selection of the prize favourites we pin our faith to a written and evident intellectual superiority we mistrust the boy who is said to be very good at work really but no use at exams such a boy is either so morally deficient that he cannot rise to a crisis and concentrate his energy and ideas and far be it from me to admit such a one to be a grecian or else it means that he is incapable of literary composition or self-expression or else that his thoughts and facts are so confused that he cannot write them down there is a great deal wrong with boys who fail at examinations furthermore i believe in prizes i refuse to expect the young however intelligent they may be and however delightful they may find their studies to show that single-hearted devotion to work which we demand of the research scholar or the specialist how then shall we select those boys who are to be given this most full education entirely from those who are most proficient in the afternoon work what i am going to discuss now is the education that the highest form in the school will receive boys who arrive at this high standard will be where possible exempt from the technical training accorded to others they will devote morning and afternoon to the culture of the mind now all boys in the school will be compelled to take part in this afternoon work be they stupid or clever old or young the more intelligent they are the more their profession will have to suit itself to their education but we have not thought it worth while to do more than suggest by references here and there what the afternoon education will mean in early years and if i have confused the ideal and real at times i think i may be excused for it is in reality quite easy to perceive how far my ideal could be followed at the present day but to make quite clear what i actually intend i will trace the ordinary careers of oberon arthur jack montague peter and tom oberon is the son of a rich nobleman who has every faith in a humane education he does not require his boy to prepare for any examinations as he can get a diplomatic or other post if the boy demands one oberon arrives at school between the ages of ten and twelve knowing how to read write and add as he is under no necessity of learning a trade or fitting himself for a professional examination he spends the morning hours attending lessons in the latin and french languages which are being given to those boys who have to take examinations in the subject he shines in the afternoon classes he has a passion for reading plays and is never weary of observing pictures in after years he soon passes the examination which admits him into our grecians and follows their course of education which will shortly be described 
staying with us to the age of twenty-one. Arthur is little less gifted by nature than Oberon, but his father cannot support him in after life, and the school is not yet rich enough to do so. He is allowed to attend all sorts of classes in the morning. At the age of fourteen he finds he prefers sciences to languages, and determines to become a doctor. At the same time he is admitted as a Grecian. He must still continue under the old system and work at science in the morning, and receive his general education in the afternoon. It is obvious we can only teach him some of the things we teach to Auberon, so we choose for him the lightest and most amusing parts of general education, encourage him to read English and French, and to listen to music of which he is very fond. And he accompanies us on those excursions into pure reason, the nature of which we will hereafter explain. But we do not worry him with such difficult subjects as Latin and Greek. We hope he will be no worse a doctor and no less happier man for having once taken interest in things quite outside his profession. Jack's parents are very poor indeed. As a matter of fact, they are grocers in a small way, living at Kensal Rise. Yet Jack also is one of our most charming and intelligent boys. We have given him a scholarship at school but we cannot, unfortunately, support him throughout life. We must assign him a profession, and we choose for him the profession of classical scholarship as being one of those in which a man may continue the pursuit of pure learning. He will obviously profit by the same Latin and Greek classes which Oberon and his fortunate companions attend in the mornings. These classes will be in the mornings, I say, for the sake of the many people like Arthur who are spending the morning in the professional work and have no time to spend on such a difficult subject as classical learning, but are ready to join their fellow Grecians in the afternoon. But Jack will not be with Oberon for more than the morning hour which he devotes to his classics. Instead of sharing his lectures on European history and art, he will be working at the writing of Greek and Latin compositions, and unravelling the mysteries of classical philology and grammar. We never let him cram for his scholarship, yet he obtains it, which is very surprising. Montague is like Auberon, the son of a rich nobleman, but he has inherited from his family an almost ineradicable stupidity. He brightens up a little, however, when we talk to him about railway engines and motor boats. We frankly tell the Duke that we cannot give his son a good general education because he is incapable of profiting by it, but that we could turn him into a tolerable engineer. The angry peer takes his son away from us and sends him to Eton to learn the Latin genders after writing an indignant letter to the Times about our old English traditions and the value of gentlemen. Montague subsequently enters Parliament and becomes a prominent high churchman. Peter's father is a decayed tradesman, and as Peter is not a very brilliant boy and never becomes a Grecian, all he can hope for, unless we help him, is to become a decayed tradesman in his turn. Peter, however, is quite good at mathematics, and longs to be a surveyor. If we can, we help him to become one, on the understanding that he will repay us in future days when he is earning a good income. Though we have made no contract with him, contracts with miners being invalid, Peter has old-fashioned notions about what is honourable, and repays us as soon as he is able. Tom's father, never a rich man, dies leaving nothing for Tom, who is a hopeless donkey. We do not cut Tom adrift, but procure for him a position on a ranch where his athletic prowess will stand him in good stead. Poor Tom! Having now suggested by these many examples more clearly, I think, than I could have done by pages of rules and explanations, the sort of way in which various boys will be treated in our school, I will now pass on directly to explain that course of education which Oberon will follow, and which will occupy both his mornings and his afternoons, as soon as he has, perhaps at the age of fifteen, passed the examination which admits him a Grecian. In doing so, I shall refer from time to time to the beginnings of this education, to the sort of study which occupied Oberon's afternoons before he became a Grecian. But on the whole, I think I may leave the details of his early education in the humanities to common sense. The first point I want to emphasise is that we intend to assign various importance to the various branches of knowledge, of which I hold some to be of far greater value than others. 
First, and above all things, our guardians must be philosophers. The world needs men who think clearly, who consider facts in their just proportion to the universe, who are not carried away by winds of doctrine, who can laugh the laugh of knowledge at epoch-making thoughts from Budapest, or at scientific excursions into Christian apologetics. Yet I do not think it will be necessary to weary any boy who has not a special love of philosophy with the details of the history of thought or of the hundred systems of a hundred philosophers. Certain books, indeed, he must peruse to sharpen his critical faculties, but instead of worrying him with the monads of Leibniz or with the premature and cryptic utterances of Thales and Heraclitus, instead of expecting him to grasp the curious theories of Avicenna, Hutchinson and Hobbes, we will teach him Plato, Aristotle, Kant and some modern philosophies, not that he may believe, but that he may ponder. And at evening in the shady garden overlooking the sea, the Grecians will assemble round their Socrates for earnest discussion. There will be no neo-pagan revival, but a real continuation of the work attempted in the Academy of Athens. Moreover, we will permit all manner of men to come and talk to our boys, since thus only can we prepare them for a life in the course of which they will hear so many conflicting doctrines. Pragmatists shall address them with urgent persuasion on their lips. Parsons shall work on their tender emotions and threaten them with the wrath of God. Veiled mystics of the East shall expound the Sufic ecstasy or the Buddhist Nirvana or exhibit the results of that antique process, salvation through starvation, to their shuddering gaze. Are not our pupils Philarches? Are they not Grecians? In the evening we will discuss quietly together the pragmatist, the parson, and the Hindu. But I am afraid a loud outcry will rise up against us from the virtuous of this world. What about their morals? You are sapping their morals, unholy corruptors of youth. You deserve the hemlock. Insist on a religion for them. Insist at least on the Kantian categorical imperative, unless you desire your boys to re-enact the worst crimes of the house of Borgia. But having a little moral shame ourselves, we do not teach them creeds in which we do not believe, in order to save ourselves trouble. And we refuse in our talks on philosophy to leave the categorical imperative uncriticised. We teach our boys to think about ethical problems, and a person not religiously inclined might even think it was more moral to think deeply about morality and to take some trouble to form an individual code of ethics than to take the whole matter on trust from parents or priest. And the result of our boldness will perhaps not be so very dreadful. Intelligent young men, as far as my university experience goes, are seldom bestial or outrageous in their desires, and curious to relate, I have known hundreds of delightful people who have lived the most refined, elegant and humane lives without the aid of religion or even of ethics. But the pure philosopher is not a sufficient ideal. We may find, we often do find, that such a man is wanting in several respects. In resolution, in power of command, in ability to deal with a crisis, he may fail but we must confess that no mental education can form these high qualities. For them we must look to a boy's natural endowments, and perhaps to the physical training he receives, and to test them we must consider his influence with others. But we may also find a pure philosopher very deficient in his appreciation of the joy of life, and education can do something for him here. For the joy of life is not to be understood by the reading of Norwegian drama, but is the heritage of those who have unlocked the secret door that leads into the garden of the senses. Hateful to me are those ignorant and thoughtless people who say that taste has no rules and that art cannot be taught. Never did a more pernicious heresy flourish. It is quite true that we cannot inspire the blind with a passion for Rembrandt or cause the mentally deranged to read Shakespeare with delight. But one can always take an intelligent boy I speak from experience, and teach him, first of all, the history of art, and in the next place one can teach him to read, look, or listen with observation and intelligence. During this time, while he is acquiring what we may call artistic experience, he will have become vaguely appreciative. 
now and only now is the time to instruct him in the principles of aesthetic law for such law exists it is not a mere matter of individual taste whether velasquez be a better artist than marcus stone or not or milton greater than keble or vaughan velasquez is a better artist than mr stone the law is a complicated law of course but to consider its principles will be helpful and it is refreshing for those who are bewildered by the disagreement of aesthetic experts to note that the greater knowledge these experts have the more striking is their agreement in matters of appreciation the three great arts i would place in this order of educational importance literature representation music i know there are some who consider music to be the purest and best of arts because it requires for its comprehension no external intellectual effort but makes a direct appeal to the emotions the justice of this contention depends on our ideal of an art that music has less educational importance than the two other sister arts becomes obvious if we admit the contention of those who make this lofty claim for music for the understanding of a picture we require our previous observation of tangible objects perhaps an appreciation of the value and expression of human emotions certainly a subtle sympathy with a period of the world's arts life and manners but it is literature which appeals especially to educators as being always a criticism of life however incomplete we may feel that definition to be through reading literature we enhance our delight in life we must therefore give our boys the most complete literary training possible not often worrying them by examinations and commentaries nor ever dreaming to make them acquainted with all the great books of the world before the age of twenty-one instead we shall permit them to read in a pleasant library and give them advice or organise competitions in special subjects from time to time i see no reason why grecians or any other boy should ever be allowed to read perfectly worthless tales of adventure and magazine stuff except to find therein examples of bad style and stupidity this i suggest in no puritan spirit with the idea that tales of pure delight or adventure are in themselves evil but because england has produced antony hope maurice hewlett gilbert chesterton among her minor writers of romance not to mention those truly great narrators of splendid and exciting tales stevenson kipling and conrad of poetry also our boys must read the best we will not give even our youngest boys inferior or so-called patriotic poetry to read out of the false conception that such despicable stuff is specially suitable to a childish understanding yet though we will keep away from the may queen casabianca and the battle of the baltic we will certainly enliven the interest of the young in verse by giving them to read such good stories as sohrab and rustam enid and geraint or the white ship we shall teach them moreover that there are other beauties in poetry beyond metrical swing and neither in reading english nor in reading classical verse shall boys once the metre is mastered ever be allowed to read to the obvious tramp of metre in a boarding-school sing-song style it is so easy to make them read with more application of the refinements of poetic stress nor shall we fall into the opposite error and let them imagine like our great actors the blank verse should be read like prose but they shall read with dignity slowly with realization of the beauty of each word and of how in verse each word has its value not only of sense but of sound and association they shall pause at the end of the lines and mark the metre subtly and not grossly and all this may be taught to the wise we will train our grecian in the perception of different styles by giving them exercises to write in the varying styles of our english authors we expect boys to write mock cicero and tacitus why in the name of common sense can they not write mock gibbon or carlyle nor do i think for a minute that these exercises will hinder any from forming in later years an original style but rather the reverse should happen for boys so instructed will very clearly understand before they leave us that style is attained by scrupulous care and individuality of expression in the same way we shall write english not greek or latin poetry and strange to say we shall take these compositions more and not less seriously than the classical verse is taken now 
we shall not give a prize once a year for some absurd heroics on a set theme but we shall very diligently teach the art of verse initiating our boys by setting them to write verse translations from poems in other tongues our criticism will be ruthless we shall point out vulgarity of idea insufficiency of thought staleness of metaphor harshness of sound we shall not necessarily produce great poets by this training but we shall certainly produce young men who love poetry and what is rarer still who understand it the artist may have an incomplete understanding of poetry but only the artist can have a complete understanding of it it is here that we must consider which dead or living tongues our guardians must know for we shall consider at present the learning of a language merely as a means of reading a new literature latin and greek are inevitable both from the intrinsic merit of their literature and from the force of the historical tradition which edwinson once so fluently pointed out but our teaching of these languages will be revolutionary except in the case of those boys who are taking them as part of their technical training in order to win university scholarships there will be no writing and certainly if dr rouse will forgive us no speaking of latin and greek we shall let such portions of the grammar as are not very important genders and the parts of latin verbs be rather learnt in the course of reading than laboriously committed to memory we shall read very quickly in class and confine ourselves to works which are either good in themselves historically interesting or influential on subsequent thought we shall divert the young with homer easiest of great poets with lucian's vera historia with a few legends of old rome from livy and with fairy tales from apuleius we will not weary even grecians with thucydides when he talks about dreary expeditions into Etolia. but all grecians shall read the fate of the sicilian expedition and learn by heart the speech of pericles into demosthenes we will only dip of sophocles and euripides we will select the finest plays and read them as well as the Aeschylean trilogy more than once herodotus we shall read through lightly as is fitting and we shall take parts in the plays of aristophanes in merry congress of plato we shall never weary for he is good for the soul nor shall we presume to forget theocritus and the lyric fragments or those unfading roses of the anthology which tell how roses fade and only for the very young shall we bowdlerize anything since we are dealing not with urchins but with the select and chosen few in latin we will trouble no reasonable soul with plautus and terence or with more of cicero than is needed to grasp the excellent style of that second-rate intellect of ovid too who is only interesting when immoral we shall read for the style's sake some of the duller portions to the claims of those deathless school books the aeneid of virgil the odes of horace and the satires of juvenal we shall submit for their fame is deserved lucretius and catullus are too obvious to mention tibullus is a sleepy fellow and from propertius we select tacitus tells us much history and is pleasant to read nor are the letters of pliny the younger disagreeable but caesar i would abandon to the historical specialist and livy i would read in haste of apuleius only one book is essentially disagreeable the rest is charming and too long neglected now the total bulk of all that i have commended as readable in these two languages is not very large and could easily be stowed away into some twenty well-printed volumes as soon as the preliminaries are mastered we shall read through the classics for three hours a week for three years no boy except the specialist shall begin latin or greek till he is fifteen years old this will ensure i think that he does not waste about five years in learning grammar but attacking a not very difficult subject at a riper age will master it within a quarter of the time it would have taken him had he after the usual school fashion begun latin at the age of nine and greek at the age of eleven he should therefore be ready at the age of sixteen for our three years classical course and though we shall not spend anything like as much time over the classics as do other schools which are still hampered by the renaissance and scholastic traditions and by external examinations 
i believe our boys will love the classics more and obtain a fuller understanding of the classical spirit than those to whom latin and greek are a ceaseless drudgery and evil i believe they will learn no less than others have learnt from these time-honoured studies that calm and even fervour of mind that sane and serene love of beautiful things that freedom from religious bigotry and extravagance which marks the writings of the greeks and that serious decorum and strength that sense of arrangement and justice which marks the writings and still more the history of the romans we have now to consider in how many modern european tongues we are going to give universal instruction not forgetting that our grecians are going to have so much time to themselves so many hours when they are simply to go into the library and read that it will be easy for us to encourage and help any boy of linguistic ability who discontented with what we can teach him desires to enrich his knowledge of those languages he learns in school or to attempt some rarer and more exciting tongue spanish swedish russian or even persian fired perhaps by the eloquence of some literary specialist whom we have invited to lecture at the school and his translated extracts but i may surprise some if i say at the outset that i cannot consider that there is any but the slightest educational value in the actual acquisition of a modern language in learning to speak it read it or write it apart from the serious study of the literature history and traditions of a foreign people any german clerk as hoffman remarked when he so briefly dismissed those who suggested that a good modern language education was a fine practical thing any cosmopolitan or swiss innkeeper any half-breed dragoman can gabble six or seven tongues and sometimes gabble them correctly and the dreariest lady student from russia can speak beautiful french and passable german and yet not have in her head a single russian not to speak of a german or french idea nevertheless very fine is the spirit of the true linguist which i admit to be a very different thing from the mere spirit of literary curiosity which desires to learn just enough of a language to read some favourite or famous author in the original the true linguist revels in fantastic grammars where the verbs open out in the middle to make themselves passive or negative and numerals agree with singular masculine nouns in the genitive feminine plural he delights in learning and in reproducing curious scripts whose mysterious systems of dots segmented circles or paintbrush strokes have charmed his eye he revels in making obscure noises foreign to the english ear and in planning out euphonic changes and philological laws if we have a boy filled with this spirit among our grecians we shall be delighted we shall provide him with all manner of grammars and dictionaries and persuade his parents to send him abroad for the summer holidays to perfect himself but we shall not have the time nor the inclination to devote such special attention to the three languages french german and italian which we hope to teach regularly to all our grecians we shall learn to translate from these languages and to pronounce them fairly correctly when we read them aloud to attain this pronunciation we shall most certainly not employ the ridiculously complicated script of the international phonetic association realizing as we do that the only european language for the learning of which the employment of a phonetic script is necessary is english french german and italian at all events are pronounced almost entirely as they are written what is the use sense or wisdom of having a sign like a broken hoop to represent the final o of italian and therefore forcing the miserable boys to learn two methods of writing every time they learn a language when it is so extremely easy to tell him that the final italian o is often sounded like the english o in not the refinements of pronunciation can be learnt at any time by any one who has a good ear and who already knows the language pretty well by a few months stay in a foreign country and a boy can go abroad after all at any period of his life i admit that to attain this final perfection a knowledge of phonetic laws and the use of plaster casts of throats and larynxes may be recommended but these devices are indescribably pernicious when employed in the instruction of beginners they are the conceited invention of modern science which in its desire that we should scorn useless knowledge and become practical 
would have us spend six years in acquiring a fine french accent in england without leaving us time to read a word of moliere in the early stages of instruction in french i admit that the use of such an entirely rational and immediately comprehended script as that invented for the faculté of grenoble may be attended with profit constructed as it is for the french language alone instead of being a complicated scientific universal affair which one can fit on to czech and turkish this script from grenoble clearly shows how words should be run together in reading french sentences and how the accent and pause must come after groups of words pronounced without a break yet it can be learnt in ten minutes next i admit that the teacher must be a master of french sound i do not think it however at all advisable that he should be a frenchman although we may at times call in a native to read to us or talk with us an englishman who with toil has acquired a fine french accent knows the difficulties with which the english boy has to contend so much better he only will understand english as well as french phonetics he will be able to explain that o and e are diphthongs in english without getting into a towering rage at the stupidity and perverseness of the english boy and if he is wise he will appeal to the boys to remember how a frenchman talks english an obvious way of getting boys to be interested in the pronunciation of french yet which seems never to have occurred to any teachers we shall hardly attempt to teach boys to talk or write these languages unless they are especially interested in so doing and if they are we shall only teach them to talk and write french this may displease some but there are obvious reasons for our decision firstly to learn a language so as to be able to go abroad and ask for a ticket at the station and a drink at the cafe is obviously part of technical training and not worthy the attention of serious educationalists secondly an intelligent boy if he wants to talk must go to france where in a family he will learn more in a week than we could teach him in a year the true educational value of talking a language consists in getting the ear attuned to subtle new and delicate sounds and this we preserve by emphasizing the necessity of reading it aloud we shall perhaps then spend a little time in french conversation viewing it not as an end but as a means towards eradicating that awkward shyness which some of the most pleasant and intelligent young englishmen feel at opening their mouths before foreigners but how much better it would be if we could send them abroad for a month a year to talk with french german and italian boys to view the beauties and delights of foreign towns foreign institutions and foreign manners if we could arrange for them to have some one better than the usual dreary pasteur or fara to talk with and to hear lectures by the most famous foreign teachers if we were rich enough or powerful enough to institute this van der Jaar system for our boys our training in modern languages would then become one of the most important and fascinating parts of their education but if we cannot do this we can initiate them into these three great literatures and we can teach them to read foreign books not at the rate of a page an hour but swiftly and with pleasure you may perhaps be a little surprised if i tell you on what part of french literature we shall lay greatest stress for we shall not read very much french lyric poetry admirable as it is its educational value is not very large to those who have read classical and english lyric verse we shall follow consistently our plan of giving boys a pleasant introduction to subjects in which they may specialise afterwards if they will and we will make no attempt to get them to read through all that is important in french lyrical verse or indeed in any other branch of literature perhaps we shall do well if we confine ourselves to the oxford book of french verse it is a tolerable anthology not much superior in anything but length to that admirable sixpenny son meilleur poem and woefully inferior to that splendid collection the oxford book of english verse if we consider further what french lyric author a boy would do well to read through i can think of none better than le comte de lille there is no more suitable book for boys in french than his clear and powerful poem barbare we shall omit erkman chatrian's waterloo and the good but second-rate columba from our course and no more dream of giving young boys corneille and racine 
then we would dream of trying to interest a frenchman in english by presenting him with paradise lost at first we shall read such diverting and interesting books as le bourgeois gentilhomme les trois mousquetaires le crime de sylvestre bonnard and certain selected short stories but it is the great french novelists who should be most esteemed by those who are training boys over seventeen years of age to face a world far less pleasant than our school only hardy and meredith among our so delightful english writers can ever impress the awakening mind so deeply with the tragic realities and possibilities of existence as do pere goriot madame bovary une vie and pierre et jean books in which the ugliness of life is faced and the psychology of passion analysed yet written at the inspiration of an ideal which is the more impressive because it is unconscious and full of the sense that a good deed is worth doing for its own sake even if it be unromantic and unknown to be recommended too are the quiet humorous thoughtful books of anatole france that gentleman socialist whose graceful and bitter laughter reviles a world gone mad a world which it is our fond dream to better by producing some half-dozen young men a year who are fit to face it we shall not need so much german as french for the language is far harder and the literature the importance of which is only a hundred years old far less important i shall be contented if we read in school the first part of faust the songs of heine part of bentzmann's collection of modern german lyrics in reading german jean paul sudermann and nietzsche should not be neglected for nietzsche has an influence which all thoughtful men should understand however much they may hate him and a style second to none in german freytag and grillparzer and other pompous triflers we shall neglect but we shall remember that heine wrote prose hardly inferior to his verse we must attach however far more importance to the language of the germans than their purely literary achievements could warrant all boys who are interested in science art or archaeology will soon find out that they must be able to read the barbarous prose of this most educated and learned people since in every branch of pure learning the germans have produced some masterwork some epoch-making treatise italian we shall reinvest with the honour and importance which it has so unjustly lost since the first half of the nineteenth century in the days of peacock no gentleman with any pretension of culture could afford to dispense with the smattering of this delightful tongue whose literature we now imagine to be represented by dante petrarch and the promessi sposi of manzoni it is sad to think that there are now not a hundred living englishmen who know and enjoy the calm and classic humour of ariosto or who care anything for the countless masters of early italian lyrical verse which eugenia levi has collected in her two fascinating volumes yet no classical scholar can be excused for not taking the trouble to learn to read this easiest of languages when a fortnight's work will enable him to read any average italian prose with fluency and enjoyment our boys shall know a great deal of dante a little of petrarch the two great collections of italian verse to which we have referred besides a little anthology by carducci which extends to the nineteenth century nor shall they neglect to read the splendid barbarous odes of carducci himself which based on the horatian meters form so brave a protest against the natural deficiency of a tongue wherein rhymes are too easy and compression too hard several of the tales of boccaccio even some of bandello and masuccio claim consideration for they do not all consist as some imagine of indecent ribaldry but are full of pathos humour and most cunning psychological observation and why neglect the cortigiano our playwrights shall be goldoni and d'annunzio perhaps not the d'annunzio of the terrible citta morta but certainly the d'annunzio of francesca de rimini for are we not the heirs of the italian renaissance and shall we continue to neglect a literature not inferior to the french and far greater than the german a literature which in the present age has produced at least two immortal names least of all can we dream of so doing after gazing at the masterpieces of italian painting would it not be well to know what these great men read thought and wrote have we forgotten that italy is also the first 
and will perhaps be the last home of the purest and most noble music to understand the spirit of the greatest artistic country the world has ever known greater in my opinion than greece herself by virtue of leonardo and michelangelo not to mention scalati and pegolese is surely the direct duty of any one who desires to enjoy all that life can offer and to assist others to share his delight we must now consider the arts of representation instruction in which will be such a peculiar and delightful feature of our school we must adopt in teaching this subject methods similar to those we adopted for teaching poetry i mean that we must not begin by laying down aesthetic laws but by considering art historically numerous photographs reproductions and casts must adorn our buildings or fill our portfolios we must show magic lantern slides we must take our boys to visit the great galleries at london and hampton court and in this way we must form as far as residents in england can do so the basis of artistic experience we shall have three direct ways of training our boys they must notice things in pictures they must regard nature from an artistic point of view and they must attempt to represent things for themselves however clumsy their efforts be every boy must draw and paint for at least three hours a week not copying absurd patterns but inventing for himself or imitating nature our object in this our practice of art as in practice of poetry will not be to train up artists but who knows whether some young velasquez will not suddenly discover his powers in this way but to enable boys to appreciate art technically and soundly those who would be artists or architects must have special morning training for their professions at all events we will have no sonneteering about art in the windbag style of john addington simons no vain talk of the grandeur sweet loveliness invincible truth and tragic terror of pictures we shall study rather to ensure a minute trained observation into shades of style and variations of detail for only in this way can we teach boys not naturally artists to perceive every portion of a picture and not its subject alone we shall also and this will be a most important part of our pictorial education take bad and popular modern works luke files doctor or dixie's picture of the knight impressed by the crucifix as examples of inferior art and point out in these either the defects of drawing and colour or the complete inanity and vulgarity of idea the introduction of this artistic education i consider the most revolutionary the most important of new proposals it may interest you to know that i was for some time both at oxford and cambridge i must have known some three hundred undergraduates most of whom were considered or considered themselves to be the most intelligent young englishmen of the day yet i do not remember more than four or five of them who could have told the signorelli from a titian or who have ever heard the name of pisanello to possess any knowledge of art was considered by my otherwise intelligent friends to be something rather extraordinary and priggish perhaps indeed the character of an undergraduate art lover would be bound to suffer in so philistine an atmosphere yet there is no happier man than he who loves painted things for the whole realm of nature becomes exalted in his eyes he looks at the world and imagines great pictures in his soul he looks at great pictures and begins to realize the unspeakable beauty of the world and what is greece to those who do not love the sweet spring of her vases and the immortal strength of her statuary how can men appreciate the great life of the modern world without knowing something of mani pizarro whistler and all those once obscure heroes who despite penury and starvation imprisoned the wonders of bright light on painted canvas a few japanese prints or persian miniatures or indian bronzes are these not the only things that can suggest to us who cannot read those literatures or voyage to those lands the marvels of each racial individuality yet in our public schools where still so much of the true humane education lingers the artistic life is entrusted to some ill-paid pedagogue who has drawn a little at the slade school and is usually considered to be rather inferior in intellectual ability and social standing to the other members of the staff it is perhaps the worst mistake in english public school life 
for even those boys who learn drawing and excel in it will never get any real encouragement or help i confess that my enthusiasm for music is not so great as my enthusiasm for the arts of representation i have known only too many good musicians especially those who were simply good performers who outside this one specialised atmosphere were not only stupid but exhibited the most appalling mental vulgarity i do not view with favour perpetual toil on iron frame pianos i should like to leave the performance of instrumental music solely to those who show their love and capability and musical genius is always revealed early in life but every boy as soon as his voice is set or before it breaks might learn to read music and sing in part and one could have at least once a fortnight a concert for the hearing of which some boys would have been prepared by giving them the scores to read and explaining the modulations and subtleties of the tune this is never done the consequence is intelligent boys who have not exceptional gifts usually prefer the vilest musical comedy to mozart it is not they are deaf to sounds as a rule but simply that they have no conception of the aim and structure of classical music we have considered the education we intend to give in philology and fine arts we must still examine whether we are to teach history mathematics and science we shall have little difficulty in settling the place of history in our routine no study seems more specious as a substitute for liberal education in the arts yet it is dangerous to view it too seriously or give it too much importance history is a fascinating tale which should be read only in the works of a great prose writer who is capable of doing it justice but it is a story with so little of moral or of meaning a story which may well make us discontented sceptics and cause us to despair of the progress of mankind for philosophies of history have not succeeded not even hegel could thread together the promiscuous events of the world's life into a connected whole we say this however only as a warning to those who are too enthusiastic or who imagine that the study of the historical method has a supreme value in education it is obvious that our grecians must have such acquaintance with history and especially with modern history as will enable them to understand the political life of the present and the artistic life of the past it is obvious that it will be good for them to read not in class perhaps but to themselves such noble books as gibbon Mommsen, italy and her invaders or fife's history of modern europe obvious that since they have to read herodotus thucydides and tacitus we shall teach them in reference to these authors some of the latest results of historical research yet we need seldom insist on their learning dates and sketching out the plans of battles nor shall we fatigue them with the history of the dull periods of the world but in their last year at school those young men of twenty who are likely to be directly interested in the government of our country must specialise in modern history in state theory and in the science of economics but we shall find history most useful as a pleasant and instructive afternoon diversion for those not very intelligent boys who are working to enter a trade or profession it is perhaps the simplest and most obvious method of inducing an ordinary mind to be interested in an extraneous world for the very reason that it is too shallow a subject to have a prime importance in the higher education i would suggest that our grecians be compelled to learn sufficient mathematics to prevent their being put to shame in the affairs of life and no more unless they specially desire it that a training in pure mathematics has an educational value i readily admit it is beneficial if a boy be clever enough to apply mathematical principles to argument and discussion but neither is it necessary to become an abstruse or advanced mathematician in order to be able to apply the elementary mathematical law nor do boys who are trained in philosophical thought need to acquire the principles of logic by such circuitous means of the teaching of elementary arithmetic and geometry to the ordinary or young boy we have already dealt with hoffman's aid and i am thankful to say that there are distinct signs that our educationalists are weary of stocks discounts and wallpapering we have suggested that the younger boys will delight in working out the problems of simple geometry for themselves when they measure buy and design their wood constructions in the workshop we hope that our grecians will perpetuate a love for manual craft of this kind 
that they were long to construct ambitious models to design furniture worthy of their artistic training to paper their own rooms and bind their own books for not even the physical exercise which compels them to measure themselves in that athletic prowess for which a boy always has been and always will be most admired by his fellows will have a more salutary effect than the patient toil of saw and plane in keeping them from priggishness and from any form of dreamy intellectual superiority shall we let those whom we are training to be rulers be so stupid or haughty that they will have to sit still in cushioned seats while a hired mechanic repairs the incorrigible car these remarks refer to applied science as much as to applied mathematics but we must return a moment to the study of pure mathematical theory we must hope to find a wonderful teacher who will suggest the mystery and charm of numbers to his pupils without perhaps directly saying a word about that mystery and charm who will recognise that even among grecians not one boy in a hundred is likely to become a great mathematician and will therefore make no attempt to weary his class by forcing them to work out innumerable examples but rather hope to interest them in the delight he himself takes in mathematical problems by selecting the most fascinating and important examples of mathematical method natural science must now be our most difficult consideration science is an exacting mistress and if i decide that we shall not insist on our grecians penetrating its glorious secrets let no one think that i say this in a spirit of hostility or contempt least of all while i sit here in view of florence and remember that her triumphs of art are triumphs not of a mere vague aesthetic delight but of inquisitive patient universal research into the nature of things and into the hidden laws of the world by scientific study uccello learnt the joys of perspective signorelli some alas not all of the secrets of anatomy brunelleschi the architectural principle which enabled him to construct that huge and splendid dome that stands so quiet and impressive in the last hours of this foreshadowing afternoon yet science brooks no rival in her house he who would follow her must abandon other joys and spend long hours with her alone to suggest to our grecians the charms and delights of science will be our duty but those who would set about to perfect themselves therein must do so in after years but i will at all events give no countenance to the foolish and vulgar hostility with which so-called classical men too often treat science and her followers though one can easily explain to them their foolish error they see that the youth of england with its puritan hatred of the useless and beautiful strong in its all-pervading and plebeian common sense has devoted itself to natural science with barbaric vigour also they have observed with disgust that even the oldest and firmest established homes of classical learning cannot entirely resist the clamour for a more profitable and vital course of instruction that many of their pupils have abandoned the dissection of latin periods for the dissection of flowers and corpses therefore it is that so many second-rate and a few first-rate but narrow classical scholars have raised this most vulgar outcry against the vulgarity of science not perceiving that they are confusing science with a section of her followers was leonardo vulgar natural science unaccompanied by other studies is a poor training for the mind though i can conceive it to be a far better one than these arid pedants could possibly give with their syntax and paradigms scientific men are so often headstrong in their own conceit they are fond of laying down the law on subjects they have not attempted to master and some of them like nordau have the impertinence to pose as authorities on morality aesthetics and religion the opinions and arguments of scientific men seldom rise above the level of a childish materialism which any serious philosopher could disprove in two minutes they are utterly incapable of clear thought yet imagine that philosophers must be muddle-headed because they are not persuaded by their common-sense arguments furthermore they are either neglectful or contemptuous of most artistic life though they are often fine musicians a refined man i admit will never become vulgarized by science but it seems very clear that science can never refine the vulgar i do not think then that my grecians will be expected to do more than attend two weekly lectures delivered in non-technical language on scientific laws the enthusiasts may work as much as they want 
we shall provide laboratories and specially encourage perhaps some of the less difficult branches of scientific study i do not think moreover that our school museum will contain such a collection of riff-raff as may usually be found in those primitive establishments bowls from palestine a pipe from russia specimens of swiss pottery and indian shells a cork model of the Colosseum, twenty ill-stuffed birds under glass and a photograph of the moon we will attempt rather to give our museum a real and systematic interest not crowding it with ethnological specimens unless we can afford a magnificent number but rather priding ourselves on our neat and systematic collection of local flora and fauna we have now considered the higher education a word remains to be said on some few miscellaneous points we have not mentioned the education of women i do not think either the advantages or the dangers of co-educational schools are very great the presence of girls certainly tends to prevent a boy from inclining to certain perversions but it cannot be doubted that there is a grandeur and beauty about our monastic schools which the presence of women would destroy and if one observes those who have been brought up in co-educational schools one is very apt to find them over sentimental or otherwise eccentric i think the girls reap practically all the benefit i would rather women were educated by themselves but i fear the inferiority of the female schoolmistress and indeed of the female mind is so great that they will never be educated as our grecians are for the ideal education for a woman would be exactly the education we give our grecians with a most special and most severe stress laid on philosophy and on free thought in order to eradicate the sentimental viciousness of the sex and women must learn above all to read their books unexpurgated without losing the modesty of youth yet this it seems a boy can do often and a woman never have we not seen that greatest of girls schools in the west of england have we not remarked its sumptuous buildings pseudo-antique asymmetrical gaudily tricked out in the most execrable taste have we not seen girls who have never heard of augustus or velasquez and could not see through a leading article plodding through beowulf learning by heart their german grammar acting before admiring friends such masterpieces of english literature as charles kingsley's saint's tragedy and amusing themselves with chip carving did not that truly great woman who achieved so much in the emancipation of her sex from a tradition which permitted them to study little but singing and deportment write down that latin was dangerous for girls to read and commend the bracing effects of hebrew and german poetry schiller's glocke forsooth or the faust seduction scene i wonder it is a pity for where will our grecians find women fit to be their life companions and friends i might in this place make a brief observation with regard to day schools there is only one argument that can be adduced in favour of day schools they do not tend like our great public schools to create a monotonous type such an education as we should give would destroy the argument to my mind the great curse of day schools is that boys should live perpetually with their parents only one parent in a thousand is fit to manage an intelligent boy a boy may be bullied in school it would be nothing to the way in which he will be bullied at home if he is ever so little exceptional ever so little inclined to disagree with the parental outlook then again if he is punished at a day school it is immediately known at home every little punishment is a punishment twice over it is a horrible system this ceaseless double supervision i speak thus strongly not because i wish to break down family ties but because i earnestly wish to preserve them the boy who loves his parents rightly will be sad to leave them rejoice to find them again after many days their influence is deeper finer more pathetic when transmitted through loving letters and accepted in loving replies the individual parent who being human must have foibles is sunk in the ideal parent the loving watcher over the destiny of his far-off child every honest man recalling his own school days will agree with me in this another point if you think as perhaps you do that our education attempts too much remember what we have cancelled from the ordinary sixth form routine nearly all the preparation which occupies two hours every night is gone all translation can be done very well unseen three hours a week for classics three for drawing 
an evening a week each for a philosophical discussion, a lecture in literature, a lecture in science or mathematics, three hours each for reading the four great modern literatures, and three for the practice of English prose and verse, an hour for history, an hour a day in the library, twenty-eight hours a week, excluding evenings. There is room to fill up what I've forgotten. We should next briefly consider the position our Grecians will occupy in school affairs. They will all be monitors, and no other boys, however successful athletically, however superior in character, will be given the honour. It is the tribute we shall pay in our school to intellectual pre-eminence, and only those who have been to a school which was ruled by the heroes of its rugby football team can realise how admirable was the system which Arnold suggested. They will have the power of punishing other boys by giving them detention. The actual punishment will be inflicted in this way under the supervision of the masters. There will be no physical appeal against their authority. In a school of about 500 boys, we may hope for 30 Grecians. They will have a common room, will alone have private studies, will be allowed, when they are over 17, to smoke and drink wine in moderation, for it will be our policy to encourage them in self-restraint, not to put temptation out of the way. The rest of the school will not be divided into houses. That is a pernicious system by which a boy only sees some 30 of his fellows, and cannot get away from the aggressiveness of those schoolfellows whom he dislikes. We shall send our Grecians to keep order throughout the school and in the dormitories, which are to be open and not partitioned, and we hope in this way to test and prove their powers of government. Few realise or remember that it is much harder for the unpopular boy to manage his fellows than for an unpopular ministry to manage the state. No one is more relentless, ingenious, persistent in hatred, than the schoolboy who dislikes and despises those who are set over him. Our Grecians will be allowed to play games or not as they please, but we must insist that the captain of games in the school be a Grecian himself. I discussed with some impatience, if you remember, those who desired us to give instruction in morals, but that was not because we do not care about the morals of our Grecians, but because my imaginary objectors desired me to be immoral enough to tell them lies. But not even a Genai on Sudos will be admitted to defile the education of our Grecians, though I am afraid we may have to talk dogmatically to the rest of the school. The greatest moral influence that the Grecians can possibly receive must be their own tradition and public feeling, and the example of great books and the deep friendship and respect they feel for those high-principled men whom we hope to find to teach them. We will not say to boys who are reading Plato, God wrote down in a book that you must not lie, therefore you will go to hell if you do so. We will not say to them that happiness in this earth belongs to the moral, but we will say to them, the school, your kind mother and gentle guardian, hates the vulgar and sensual life, and detests that which is mean and false. Hoc dice, aut dicede. And though we will not be as ruthless as some are to the natural faults of the headstrong, generous and warm-blooded youth, yet if we consider a Grecian, however intelligent, to be ineradicably coarse, dishonest, or mean, he shall not remain in our society. And the last and most important of our considerations is the schoolmaster. Yet, strange as it may seem at first, I do not despair of finding ardent, learned, and admirable young men at our universities, who would far rather teach than become dons or Indian magistrates, if we gave them a salary worth the name, assured them a pension, and treated them with honour. Too often the modern schoolmaster has to take up his profession because there is nothing better for him to do. He is consequently, and with some justice, supposed to be a man not clever enough to obtain a fellowship, or not energetic enough to enter the state service. He is a social outcast or a social failure. He ranks with the curate. He is an ill-dressed, ill-shaved non-entity. Our masters will be, at first, men carefully chosen for their charm and intelligence and not merely according to the results of their university work. Later, the best of our old boys will rejoice to return to us and help us. Masters in La Giocosa are not treated as subordinates, but as honourable friends of the headmaster. They live with him, dine with him nightly, and fare with the best. They are men who do not imagine their education is complete. They are a band of older Grecians. 
they need not be mewed up within school walls for three quarters of the year but must have all the society they can find every chance of visiting london every opportunity of conversing with specialists who come to lecture and the wise men and travellers who come to visit i think strange to say we shall find it easy to find those who will adequately teach our earnest and gentle-mannered grecians shall we give less honour to those who do the ceaseless drudgery and rough work of the school who help the infants to write and read and add or try to drive the foolish through accidents and syntax shall we not rather let our chief masters do this difficult elementary noble work in turn and not attempt to maintain a staff of less clever less refined and serious men for this the hardest portion of the school work and the choice of masters and the success of the whole school must depend on one man the grave and learned senior who is to be our head alas that we cannot recall vittorino from his grave yet if we could what princes would send their sons to la giocosa in these iron days who appreciates the humanities now apart from the picturesque dignity that hangs about them still who cares for any real thought about education who dares to make an ideal some listen to the conceited lying scientist who writes pedantic treatises on habit brain formation and memory and veils his tired platitudes in the ugliest of technical terms and here they fondly imagine lies the secret of success some are willing to let our old beautiful schools rot away till they become hotels where the newly rich may consort with the matoid nobleman in foolish calm they await the time when a relentlessly progressive age will hurl them aside in disgust never do they attempt a reform which is to make them liker their true selves but they cringe to public examinations and public feeling and make each unworthy concession either with ill grace or a puerile flourish of trumpets but we will refound la giocosa and build it anew in england beside the sea that typifies our race and if i have made no single direct reference to patriotism let me say this now patriotism is not taught by bad poetry and bad literature by rifle clubs or union jacks or essays on tariff reform la giocosa will give england men of intelligence fit to govern her and not private soldiers fit to be shot down for her in some financial war and in training grecians la giocosa has fulfilled her duty to england ours shall be no ideal school for the ideal youth but a place where hard work is done and where boys are toilfully prepared for the difficulties of a modern world yet where too we shall train many to understand and love the sweet pleasures of the senses we even hope that a few of our scholars will be among the great now my friends our long and toilsome journey is over and it is evening evening indeed had come and the cool hours of the day but those two who listened to the unadorned words of this strange youth heard and understood the earnestness in his voice and as they gazed at him while he lay there on the grass refolding his sheaf of papers they thought of his gentle voice and eager words and he seemed to them to be none other than one of his own grecians strayed from some elysian school where socrates and vittorino teach and all the young lords of that shadow world listen and admire and whether their journey with him was ended whether they would return to england to the old and weary toil strengthened by this secret and beautiful ideal or whether they would not rather join him and rebuild la giocosa to the sound of music in an atlantean isle in that swift minute of wonder they could hardly tell end of the grecians end of part fourteen